So uh, let's try, first of all, to explain all the fuss about judiciary reform and the Supreme Court of Israel. First of all, mm -hmm. uh, we have to keep in mind that Israel is a country without checks and balances on democratic power, like some other countries in the world. Israel does not have written constitution. Uh, Israel has only one chamber of the parliament and so on and so forth. We can say that the Israeli government, which has the backing of the Knesset, we can assume that, yeah. uh, has great power in Israeli politics aside of Supreme Court. So please explain us what is the problem with the Supreme Court, why the people are on the streets, why Israel is uh, at, at some sort of a boiling point with, with this question, mm. what is the intention of the Israeli government and what are the possible consequences if this reform goes through? Yeah. So, as you said, um, Israel has a very, very strong government. Structurally speaking, um, our parliament is very, very weak, and it does more or less whatever the government asks of it. And so, because we do not have a constitution, the only body within the structure of the Israeli state that can really um, function as a check on executive power is the Supreme Court. And what the government now is trying to do uh, in the last, last eight months in, in what it calls uh, a judicial reform is to basically take over the courts, um, take over uh, the Supreme Court, take over the appointments, make them um, um, fully uh, politicized um, and uh, um, take whatever powers the court has currently over the parliament and the government, take it away from, from it so that it it cannot really limit anything the government does anymore. Uh, so that's that's um, that's what the reform aims for. Um, and it's dressed in this rhetoric of democracy. So basically what they're saying is that we were elected uh, and we were elected for this. Uh, and, and so this is our right um, to do uh, whatever reforms we, uh, we seek to, to do. Um, but millions of Israelis realized um, very shortly after this was announced, actually, um, that this is the very same path other, other countries in the world followed in the last few years. Hungary is the prime example, but Poland as well, Venezuela, uh, India to a certain extent, Russia before that, um, where elected leaders do have a popular mandate, but they take advantage of it to um, hollow out democracy. Okay, so Israel is understood that this is this is happening here now. It is our turn to our great, great surprise because we like to think of ourselves as a very stable democracy. Um, and they took to the streets to stop this from happening. Um, so yeah, this is the this is a story of the last few months, and we've never seen a mobilization on 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 this scale in Israel. Every week for eight months, hundreds of thousands of people take to the streets to protest, um, and uh, this is unheard of. We are a country of ten million people, so a huge chunk of the population has really dedicated its life <laughs> since January for this fight uh, for Israeli democracy, which um, um, makes me very proud, actually, as an Israeli citizen. So the hearings uh, before the Supreme Court started uh, on Tuesday. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more about the timeline and the possible outcomes. Tell us about the procedure that we can expect uh, regarding this matter. Yeah, so um, when the so-called reform was announced in January, it consisted of um, a few parts. Um, the protest movement uh, uh, succeeded in blocking most of it, something like, I would say, 90% of the program, to the great surprise of the government. They thought they would just let, you know, have a legislative blitz and pass it all. But they couldn't because the resistance was huge, by the way, even among their own supporters. And so they managed to pass only one law, um, 
um, which um, is not the most important part of the reform, but it, it's still a, an important part. Uh, and it limits the court's um, ability to um, serve as a check on, on executive power. Um, and yesterday, the Supreme Court itself um, held a hearing uh, dedicated to this very uh, to, to, to this very legislative change, um, where, where, where the hope of the, of the movement is that the court over, overrules this uh, legislative um, initiative of the government that had already passed. Um, we're not sure if it's gonna if it, if it's actually gonna do it, and if it and if it is, it's gonna take a while before that happens, right? It's gonna take um, about a month and a half or two months before they have a decision, um, uh, before they have a ruling, and so even if it happens, it's only one part of the of the whole program, and so um, I think it's not. It was um, it was um, politically important, publicly important to have you know the representatives of the government there arguing for the change, and um, the representatives of the movement and the opposition arguing against it. Um, a lot of people watched the hearing uh, yesterday for hours on end, which is quite amazing. Um, listening to all these um, um, judicial argumentation, um, but in the end. I don't think we um, uh, th this is going to be the way out of of the crisis, because even if it over, even if the Supreme Court overrules this one change, it's only one uh, among many other changes the government is trying to do. And by the way, these are not only the changes the ref judicial reform consists of. The government is also trying to take over in different ways, take over the the media, the public broadcasting company. Um, um, change the curriculum of schools. Um, so there are a lot of dimensions to this sort of to this new um, hollowed out democracy that they're trying to establish here. It's not only the courts, um, and this is something the movement tries to emphasize again and again. They're trying to do it in different spheres of life. So let's try to be fair on the government's point of view and the opposition's yeah. as well. Please explain us in the simple terms why this government is doing this, what is the aim, and why the uh, civil society and the Israeli opposition is against it. Yeah. So I would say um, it, two forces are joining hands here. On the one hand, there is uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister, who is... Um, um, involved in his own um, legal problems. Yeah, uh, he's been indicted criminally uh, for corruption charges, charges in, in, in a few different, in a few, um, um, what's the word? Sorry for that. Um, in a few cases. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry, cases. Should I start over? Should no, I start no, over? you don't have to, no, it's fine. Ah, okay. Um, so there is, on the one hand, Benjamin Netanyahu, Israel's uh, longest serving prime minister, um, with um, different corruption charges against him. So he's um, deeply entangled in, le in legal problems and has a personal interest in attacking the judiciary um, and the whole uh, Israeli uh, legal system and frighten it and change it. So this is on the one hand, and he's got his own his own party full now of people who are uh, personally loyal to him, and who um, are very much troubled by the rule of law. We see that in in their action in their everyday actions, they are very keen on appointing um, um, political um, lackeys to different uh, positions within the government of. Um, of uh, using state budget to enrich um, friends and sectors who vote for them. So they, they feel limited by, um, by the fact that there is a Supreme Court and that it has some power over the government. So it is people who are interested in corruption and Netanyahu who's uh, probably interested in his trial. And they've joined forces with a much smaller minority among the Israeli right of people who are deeply 
anti anti liberal and they've been so for many many years um they um have been espousing this worldview um for 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 many years and they have they have think tanks and they have uh, media outlets and they are truly anti-democratic ideologically speaking so um it's a Netanyahu is the one who brings the votes and the public support and he can also market it to a lot of people um and there's a and there's a smaller group of deeply ideological people who bring uh the the the, the program itself right so it originates from the um religious right in Israel um but it is in Netanyahu's interest now to promote their ideas that have been on the fringes of Israeli politics for a long time. So it's these two forces helping each other um, that uh, bring us the so-called judicial reform. Okay, uh, let's talk about uh, the character of Netanyahu's government. Uh, yeah. Between election cycles, it seems that Israel is moving between each election cycle more and more to the right. We now have mm -hmm. the fact that, for example, Naftali Bennett was a coalition partner with the liberal government, previous government, and now Netanyahu is in, is in some sort of a political alliance with the hard right. Some people in Israeli government advocating that Israel should abandon democratic, because Israel is a Jewish democratic state, that that part, democratic, is uh, is a too much. It's a Jewish state. So yeah. why is Israel moving so fast, so far to the right between each election cycle? And where so, is, where is, for example, Israeli left? Uh, Labour Party has a big history mm -hmm. in Israeli Israeli politics, not to mention Ehud Barak or Golda, Golda Meir or some other uh, statements of Israel. Left-wing political organizations practically do not exist in today's Israel politics. Why is that? So um, the left has suffered a huge crisis after the collapse of the of the peace process. Um, 20 years ago in the Second Intifada. Um, the peace process, process collapsed and with it, the main issue advanced by the Israeli left. Um, but the left's voters are still there and they vote for liberal parties, whether they are on the left or, or, or on the center, which is where most liberal voters are nowadays. Um, so numerically speaking, they are certainly still there and they're a very important force in Israeli politics. Um, but it is true that we see um, the political spectrum tilting to the right. And, and that happened because um, Netanyahu decided that some parts of the Israeli right, which for many, many years had been um, barred from participating in governments, he decided to legitimize them. So these anti-democratic forces who are um, proudly racist, and believe that um, um, uh, the uh, Arab citizens of Israel do not deserve the same rights as the Jewish uh, citizens of Israel, et cetera, et cetera. They um, were not part of governments. They were never part, part parts of, of, of Israeli governments. And actually the, the most, the, the fiercest opposition to them came from the liberal right, from, from Netanyahu's own party. For many years, they treated them as people who must never be legitimized, you know, if 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 one of them gave a, a representative a representative of theirs gave a speech in the in the in parliament, they would leave they would leave the room. So there was a consensus within Israeli politics that these are not partner political partners of anyone. And Netanyahu, a few a few years ago, decided to extend the hand to. Um, to these uh, political actors and invite them in. And in, in fact, one of them is now in charge of the Israeli police and the Israeli um, secret service. So he is the minister of um, uh, Homeland Security. So not only did he invite them in, but he gave them uh, um, immense power over Israeli society and the Israeli state. Um, 
and so we see that in many in many other countries as well. The radical right, um, um, he, its participants in governments and its ability to influence politics is many times uh, dependent upon uh, what the mainstream right does, what the liberal right does. Um, and in our case, Netanyahu for I, both, I think, uh, for, for his own personal interests, uh, but also, I think, um, for ideological reasons, decided that actually he could um, um, form a coalition with them, which was unthought of up until a few years ago. Um, so, yeah, that, that's what happened. That's what happened. Um, the, um, uh, I would say, definition of what is legitimate within Israeli politics changed very, very rapidly. You know, things that have never been said on television or in parliament are now openly stated. Um, and so, so public life here has changed very, very radically over the last few years. So if you have to put your money on, on the outcome, what is the outcome? I have no idea. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm not going to put my money um, anywhere. I think because, because, because events are so surprising, you know, if you, if you had told me a few months ago that we'd see such a civil uprising in Israel against uh, the government's anti-democratic reform, I would never have believed you. Um, so who knows? I do think it's very clear to everyone that the reform will not pass, not fully. There is too much opposition within Israeli society from the international community and from Netanyahu's own supporters who never signed up for this. You know, they wanted the, they wanted the um, a prime minister that handles the cost of of living crisis and personal security issues and crime. That's what he promised them. He never spoke about the reform. This was a surprise to everyone. Um, and so I think um, uh, his own support is not being very uh, passionate about this. Plus you, uh, this huge resistance from Israeli society and the international community means that this will not, most of it will not pass. Uh, but I do not think that these, um, anti-democratic forces within Israeli politics will give up, even if this whole thing collapses, crumbles down. Um, this is their worldview, and they will continue to advance it gradually, subtly over, I think, the, 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 over the next few years. So, which is something actually that they've been doing, right? So they've been doing it for, it, it didn't start today, it started maybe 10 years ago. So if they return to doing things more gradually, um, I think we'll, ha we'll have to deal with this um, threat to our state um, and to our democracy for many years to come. But this is the, you know, this is the uh, battle of my generation. N no, none of us thinks that this is going away. Even if we defeat this particular reform, um, there's a whole political camp here that is radicalizing by the day and that is um, intent on changing um, the rules of the game here. And I don't think they're gonna give up very easily, even if we defeat them in this round. Mr. Levy, thank you very much for your time. You're welcome, thank you.